Welcome to EPG Patshala. I am Dr. Iraj Parucha. I am Director of Bharti Vidya Pits Environment Institute in Pune. The module in this uh, session is about India's Biodiversity Act and it is part of the paper on environment and society. What are we going to address in this session? We need to understand what the Biodiversity Act and its background is about to the conservation of biodiversity as well as its sustainable use. To begin with, we need to understand what biological diversity is about. And biodiversity is about all living things on Earth. It deals with plants and animals and ecosystems, natural ecosystems, as well as man-made ecosystems. So we also need to talk about cultivars and about the type of livestock breeds that we have in our country. This is what we intend to preserve in the long term in our country. We also need to understand what traditional knowledge means. And in understanding traditional knowledge, we need to express that this is the knowledge that local people hold across our country. The Act defines biodiversity as wild species as well as domestic diversity. And we need to understand that both these form the way in which people have to implement biological diversity at the grassroots level. If we go back into the history and the background of how all this emerged as a biodiversity act for our country, India signed the UN Convention on Biological Diversity way back in 1992. It took us 10 years to create this act. And the act therefore came about in 2002. We also need to understand that the act then needed various rules and regulations to be put into place so that this could be implemented. The Biodiversity Act, as we understand it, uh, has several features which we need to look at. And the Act begins by saying that we need a national biodiversity authority. This has been established in Chennai. We also have to have state biodiversity boards and very basically, at the local level, we need biodiversity management committees at both the village as well as municipal corporation levels. These are institutions for the future governance of bio biodiversity and bioresources at the very basic ground level. So this act regulates access to India's biological resources. It prevents people who are not Indians from using our resources for developing products of various types. And it also prevents results of research, which we do in India, to be transferred to other countries. This means we are bringing out that all these natural biodiversity resources are our sovereign right. The act, as I said, also deals with intellectual property rights. The knowledge and the traditional use of bioresources, which we have in our country in various communities, and therefore, it prevents the collection of bioresources without actually taking permission of the local authority. So therefore, you would need permission from the ground level of the BMC and then the state biodiversity boards and finally the national biodiversity authority. So the most important relevant governing body becomes the biodiversity management committee at the local level. These organizations are really a reflection of our panchayati raj system. And therefore, the municipal corporations and the local people who live around villages become the actual managers of biodiversity. So the BMC, therefore, is expected to initiate a process of developing a people's biodiversity register. Once the people's biodiversity register is, is designed and made, of all the local resources and all the knowledge that goes in, goes in hand in hand with them, these people will then send this local biodiversity PBR back to the state biodiversity board. The state biodiversity board is expected to endorse this and then sends it to the National Biodiversity Authority. This list of locally known plants and animals, therefore, becomes, in a sense, their own property. Once the PBR is validated, this becomes a government document, a document for governance of bioresources. 
and it gives local people control over the use of their own resources in their own environment. The PBR contains not just the list of bioresources, but how they have been locally used. And, and therefore, very often issues like medicinal plants, which have been used by the local community, have to be documented within the PBR. What does this really mean? It means that no outsider can extract bioresources without taking permission of the local biodiversity management committee. To do this, we have the ability to make a tool for access and benefit sharing of the products that could be commercially viable from the collection of these resources. So a very important part of this Biodiversity Act is that the access is controlled by the local body and if they agree to share that with another company or it goes back to make a product, then the product becomes also the revenue of that product can be, can be plowed back to the local community. The BMC can therefore prevent access to an outside agency and say, we don't want you to collect this resource from my area. Actual eventual aspect of this, which I think is very important to understand, is that if the local biodiversity management committee gives access and then that is carried to make a product, the, out, the, the revenue from that product of 2 to 3 percent has to plow back to that BMC. So it has an economic incentive as well and it is believed that this would make the local biodiversity management committee actually try to sustainably use that product. The Act ensures, therefore, the long-term conservation of biodiversity along with a certain level of sustainable use. Now, that sustainable use is an issue which one needs to address because drawing the line between unsustainable and sustainable use is a very complex process. And each village, therefore, may have its own view on what is sustainable or what is unsustainable for itself. Most BMCs, one hopes, would look at this as something which they can keep for their future generation. And therefore, they would therefore eventually use resources sustainably. What are the problems in implementation of this act? One is that it is not always possible to identify exactly the people who have collected those natural resources. Because this has to go through a long line of people before it reaches the product manufacturing stage. So how does the product actually reach the manufacturer? The local people collect the resource. It goes to a village market. The village market person transports that through a transporting agency to a taluka market. That goes to a central wholesaler. The wholesaler is then accessed by a manufacturer who then buys the resource. How do you track this back? The problem is this track back and, and saying where did this resource actually come from which ended up as a product. So the manufacturer eventually gives this to a consumer and if he has to give plow back to 2 to 3% of that revenue, he would obviously bring up the price of that product by 2 or 3%. So one also needs to appreciate that at each step of this chain, there is an added value given to that product. And therefore, it leaves the collector a very, very small percentage of what he should actually get. All the time that is taken over collecting the resource. And most of these resource collectors are the women of these villages. And they are the ones who therefore suffer this loss. Their time is not compensated for. The energy it takes to do that is not compensated for. And they are put through severe hardships for collection, collecting these resources. And yet they get a pittance for what they've actually done. So we need to understand what is the best way of backtracking these back to the actual local people who collect the resource and therefore would also want to eventually preserve it. If it's valued, it will be preserved. So how does positive conservation action take place? The most important thing is understanding the roles of these different organizations. The Biodiversity Management Committee 
it is expected that the biodiversity management committee does several things create the pbr get the PIV pbr validated sometimes the pbr creation would require inputs from a formal botanist or zoologist the state biodiversity board is expected to support this kind of activity and it does support this activity both financially as well as with people who are experts on botany or zoology so finally you have a ability to say which are the most important sites which are there around a particular area which require a better form of protection we can't make more national parks and sanctuaries in this country it's just not going to be it's, it's not going to happen anymore and therefore the best way to do this is to incentivize local people to make their own national biodiversity heritage sites these biodiversity heritage sites therefore would become small hot specks of biodiversity little areas which are conservable by the local people we also need to look at what are the powers this biological act gives and to whom does it give this power so we need to look at this from the central government side the central government side is expected to identify threatened and endangered species it is also expected to develop a national repository for the fauna and flora of the country as a whole the national biodiversity authority the first thing is that it is expected to oversee all the state biodiversity boards it's a very very difficult task and they are responsible for any of the problems that are arising due to the act the second part of the power is given to the biodiversity management committee and we need to understand that this gives control over the access for local resources but it also gives various other issues it gives the local people the ability not just to conserve but the thinking behind the process that is, is there the people's biodiversity register that they create is the actual resource base for the state biodiversity board so this is passing through various levels of governance the state biodiversity board is also expected to maintain a database of the state's flora and fauna as well as cultivars as well as livestock breeds and this then becomes their document which then transfers up to the national biodiversity authority what does this do this prevents illegal unauthorized extraction extraction of resources and and this is where the actual crux lies how do you punish offenders and this punishment for offenders is something that gradually will grow as the biodiversity act matures i would really recommend that you understand this act very very carefully and it's a very very powerful act it's something that can actually change our whole natural resource base give power to the local people who actually need this resource who have used it traditionally over long periods of time from one generation to another and this is something that i hope will happen through this whole act if we compare this act to the other acts that we have had in india let's take for example the wildlife protection act the wildlife protection act expects that the government will protect biodiversity within its national parks and sanctuaries this does not extend to other types of land use it does not look at human dominated landscapes in which there is enormous biodiversity as well both cultivars livestock but also wildlife and this therefore is a very important gap in the wildlife protection act there are other acts also the the conservation forest conservation act for example is in a sense something that the government is expected to do and it becomes a sort of government response to trying to conserve biodiversity the forest people's rights act hands this over to people without actually saying how they can do it at the ground level this act this act will do that and therefore it is something that we need to understand how this will be made to happen so how does positive conservation action take place any individual who wishes to use a resource or develop a marketable product has to fill a prescribed form
This form is developed by the National Biodiversity Authority and can be accessed through state biodiversity boards. This also applies to research projects. And if you need to do research, you would have to go to the state biodiversity board, fill the form and say, this is what I want to do. You also have to ensure whether that is for just purposes of research or whether this is going to finally end up into a product. So this is what we need to understand. How are we going to be able to legislate research programs? Some research fe researchers feel that this is very restrictive, but it will add actually to the way in which their research outputs can actually be utilized at the ground level. If we look at the Convention on Biological Diversity, we find that one of the first things that it talks about is the sovereignty, the national sovereignty of bioresources. And this is what our act actually has implemented. Therefore, if a foreign agency wants to do a research project or develop a product from that research pro pro project, then they would have to take very special permission directly from the National Biodiversity Authority. Uh, the, a very important part of the BMC's function is to clearly make known what are the traditional users' rights and the traditional knowledge systems that they own. This is their knowledge and therefore they have rights to even the knowledge that they have within their own communities. Violations against this intellectual property right of local people can really be taken to court and the offender would then be punished through the judiciary system. One of the outcomes of this act is that every biodiversity management committee can create for itself what are known as biodiversity heritage sites. And this is perhaps the most, one of the most important things that the Biodiversity Act can actually do. It can create small areas which would lead to very definitive biodiversity conservation action. Uh, just to give one example, in Maharashtra, we had a preservation plot made during British times called the Glory of Allapalli. It's an incredible forest of giant trees of various biodiversity. It has a huge lot of birds and small mammals that aggregate there in this small plot. And one of the things that the local biodiversity management committee was asking for was how do they also participate in this action of this looking after this preservation plot. And so Glory of Allapalli became the first biodiversity heritage site in the state of Maharashtra. And there are umpteen such examples across our country today. As an individual, how does this act actually help all of us to conserve biological diversity? One is that it brings about a better understanding of what biological diversity's actual economic values are, what are its social issues and social values, and therefore, how does it conserve biological diversity? Individuals need to understand this irrespective of the type of area they live in or the type of job that they have, because all of us can in some way or other contribute to conserving biodiversity. The Biodiversity Act therefore becomes your platform in trying to do conservation action. You can be a good advocate for this, you can use this through print and electronic media and therefore you become a part of the nation's ability to conserve its valuable biological resources. The State Biodiversity Board consists of a large variety of individuals. It has the local governing uh, authorities, it has uh, the implementation authorities, district collectors come play a major role in this. There are also people from different walks of life and uh, very often the board takes on experts in botany, zoology, animal husbandry, agriculture and so on. So that there is a body in the state level which is able to validate especially the PBRs which come from the grassroots level. The Biodiversity Management Committee are actually 
made and created from the local panchayat. And therefore, it is the panchayati raj system which gives strength to the biodiversity management committees. This allows for the real strength to be with the village itself, with the village community. And this is what the Act has been able to do very, very effectively in many, many situations. How does one today in the present context empower the local biodiversity management committees? One is through creating support for information on this. This information on biodiversity and its values leads to an increased awareness at the local level. And that awareness leads to a concern for biodiversity. And that concern leads to conservation action. So one of the things that the Biodiversity Act does during its implementation phase is to create this larger awareness of what biodiversity is about and why it should be conserved. How does one do this? One is through print and electronic media, but a very important way in which we have tried to do this in, in Maharashtra state is by developing a PBR for school children. And we have these little children going around in their villages, documenting the plants and animals, documenting the breeds of different uh, livestock that they have, and documenting their cultivar biodiversity, which is really responsible for nutritional levels at the local biodiversity uh, areas that we have across the state of Maharashtra. Children have done this superbly well. And we have beautiful local village level, school level bio PBRs which have been done by these school children. In summary then, what is the Biodiversity Act? What does the Biodiversity Act actually mean to you as an individual? It means that you today, by looking through the Act, begins to understand how resources are to be conserved in future and how you can use them at a sustainable level. This is what the actual outcome of the Act should be for you as an individual. Also that there has to be a realization that this has to pass through many levels of governance. It comes from the Ministry of Environment and Forest. It comes from the National Biodiversity Authority. It comes to the state biodiversity boards in all our states in India. It moves down then to local bodies such as the municipal corporations as well as the local village biodiversity management committees. Finally, it comes to people and it is about people's power over their own resources. So, as I said, we would think that the best way to look at this is to actually go through in detail the Biodiversity Act of 2002 as well as understand its local rules and regulations. And there is also a need for a film which you could visualize and say, actually, how does this work out in the field? So let's see a small video films now on how the Biological Diversity Act actually works. <laughs> 